and well met, my friends. Welcome to Stargate Twig, otherwise known as Tactical Weapons Integration Group. I am your gate master, Mike the Birdman, but I'm not al- but I'm not alone. If I can get that word out of my mouth. Uh, as we trek through the Stargates across the Milky Way, fighting the Guald and other strange creatures, I'm joined by my Unos medic. Uh, it's Alex <laughs> playing Dr. Bob. And of course the commander of SG twig. Uh, although I don't remember what your species is. Uh, I am the Carnum and it is Ken playing Saul. All right. And then finally the lone human on the team. JT from Saskatoon playing Lieutenant Carter Hall, the Bradley Cooper of this band of misfits. <laughs> I love it. All right. So when we last left our adventures, you had just gotten briefings from General PK Lawyer. You met the mysterious Agent Reed, who is asking you to perform some duties in order to look better to the Stargate program as things aren't looking too great back at SG Command with your recent performances as multiple problems have happened and you are currently on your way to the gate room as the map has returned uh, data saying Charmunda's forces are definitely on this moon and you may have a chance to strike a preemptive attack on her, but first you must gather recon. As you're walking down to the gate room, uh, one of the things that makes Phoenix Base unique is that it has a large hangar bay door that leads to the outside. That door is open. And you can see outside, it's probably about mid-afternoon by now, and you start to see vehicles taxiing in to the gate room. And when you start to see some of these vehicles begin to taxi in, you see something rather unique enter. And when you do, I'm going to put this in the Facebook chat right now. So if all of you would please go look. Uh... (laughs) The United States military has sent several crates of parts over the last couple of months. Uh, And wait, isn't this? Uh, the vehicle that was on 60 Minutes about how so many Americans keep dying in them because they're rusting out? Well, when when the program initially started, the program was called Striker, and these are still in service today, although they were field tested in the early 2000s with constant improvements. Oh. Now, because okay, you so, are part sorry, of Sorry, correction. Co- I shall correct myself so I don't sound stupid. This is not the vehicle that I thought it was from the Vietnam War that people keep drowning in. No, uh, no, 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 no. This is the modern this is, incarnation. This, this is the new, you're right. This is the new version of that vehicle that was on 60 Minutes. <laughs> yes. So, so yes, this this one isn't drowning their own soldiers during training exercises. Yes. Yet. Yet. So what you are seeing is known as the Striker vehicle. This is a light. This is a this is a eight wheeled armored fighting vehicle that has been derived from the Canadian LAV three. Uh, and yes, this has been in field testing for years. However, as you are members of Stargate Twig, you are given access to unique and experimental technologies. So as you start to see this vehicle pull forward into the dimmer lighting of the gate room, the um, the lights on the front of the vehicle flash and you can see the crow system on top which stands for, because I think it's just kind of a cool-ass acronym, that stands for, let me find it, where is it? That is the Common Remote Operated Weapon Station, or CROWS. You see it start to spin around in a uh, 360 motion. You see the lights flash at you, and as almost as if telling you to get out of the way, but they also, there's something about it too. It, it doesn't seem like the average gunnery driver. Uh, basically, they're they're deviating from protocol right now. So does anybody here want to give me a insight check? Ooh, I'm going to do that. Carter's in I'll, love. I'll roll fine. Dude. That's a natural 18, so 19 total. Okay. 22. All right, Saul, so you recognize the flash that the like it's not just move get out of the way it's actually um morris code and 
by quickly remembering what you were taught when you got to Starbase Command of Morse code. The message reads, hey, dickheads. So the vehicle pulls up to... Son of a... So the vehicle pulls up to a stop. The crew hatch in the, in the rear uh, opens up. Uh, you do hear the hiss of pressurized gas. So you're presuming this vehicle has been somewhat enhanced. And out steps Selena, fully walking again. He's like, hey guys, you miss me? You're upright. I am new and improved, you might say. Are you feeling pretty good now? Well, they did say some words I don't quite understand, though I now have more in common with Robocop than a vibrator. So, yeah, I'd say that's pretty accurate. Carter visibly has trouble holding the laugh in. <laughs> so he's like, but that's not all. I also brought some more fresh meat for the grinder. This is Gunnery Sergeant Hall. And you see this um, this little guy come up behind him. He's a, a little shorter than you might expect. He's probably about five six, but he's a uh, sh- sharp uh, looking <laughs> I guy. You were say three foot eight. <laughs> no, <laughs> he's a. Uh, Go get him! Go get that gold. <laughs> <laughs> he's a uh, sharp uh, looking young man. He probably isn't any older than than. Uh, 25 he has this big wild um mop of like uh unkempt hair which is kept under his helmet so you're wondering how he gets away with this but you see across his helmet there is a um a playing card with the ace of spades and a bullet hole through it and the hole is still there and the words dead shot appear across his helmet he's like hi guys he just kind of peeks behind selena selena also seems probably about two inches taller now so she's like well guys i am going to be the bus driver for you guys i'm not cleared for flight duty but uh general lawyer decided she wanted a friendly face to make sure you guys go through this dangerous and what can i say i've been ripped apart in one one tin can so why not another dr bob is looking at the vehicle and thinking i think i'm gonna have to be strapped to the top of it i don't think i'm gonna fit in the hatch uh so if you if you are Are able to bend down the vehicle holds approximately nine people Okay, so if I can squeeze myself in, I should or be seven okay. with Bob. Yep. I was, I was, I was gonna say like, are you just gonna like, like I'm gonna granny, six, granny six, hillbilly me. me and put me on top in a rocking chair or something? <laughs> <laughs> so you also start to look at the vehicle. You see the crow on top, which has a um, a twelve point seven millimeter machine gun. Uh, so that's pretty big. You also have a seven point six two M two forty machine gun, which would be like your squad automatic weapon, but it's mounted to the side. And you also see some experimental tech. You're not quite sure what it does, but you see these large, um, you see these large reservoirs of this liquid, uh, like substance on the side that always keeps swirling the closest thing you could approximate it to would be liquid mer- mer- mercury but it keeps moving and constant and constantly shifting and as you walk up to the hull the hull is unusually warm to the touch i mean it's possible this thing was sitting outside in the sun too long but just from your experience especially Saul because I presume the Kremlin are a technologically advanced people yep you detect the hum of some kind of an energy barrier that's probably vibrating underneath the uh, actual ceramic armor of this thing so it's throwing off a little bit of heat uh, Mike, would it be uh, insider investigation to know if I recognize Hall? Uh, yeah. Uh, roll me your insight. You might have seen him, but let let's find out. Oh, that's an eight. <laughs> um, he doesn't look familiar. Um, it's nobody you've come across because he is a gunnery sergeant. He's definitely U.S. Marines. 
uh, from what you can tell. And Selena is still captain. So the odds of you crossing paths with them, not entirely impossible, but not, but not exactly likely either. Yeah. And Carter just kind of gives him a once over and he's like, you like making things go boom, sir. I make things go boom in exceptionally gory messes. Wait till you see what the shard cannon can do. And, and when he hears that, Carter thrusts out his hand for a handshake. I like you. Let us be friends. Well, we do share an awesome last name, don't we? Yes, sir. And then so, Carter, while he says that, Carter's just looking at the crow's This is like, I'm going to mess so many things up. He's like, all right, guys, get in. So you all get inside of what is known as the bug stomper because you've, they've got that spray painted on the side and inside the uh, bugs inside the uh, bug stomper, you do see several racks of some of the experimental weapons that you brought back from the Makwa homeworld. And you also see several of the Sentinel beams there as well. Should you require them? There is two Martok staff weapons and a, and a small armament of P90 shotguns and one squad automatic machine gun. Regular so, space shotguns. Uh, they are regular shotguns. Damn it. So that the hatch is closed, correct? Yeah. The hatch is now right. closed. You can hear systems starting to come online. The interior okay. has re uh, pressurized. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk to Selena and go little, uh, little excessive of an armory, given the fact that this is just a recon mission. Well, the orders I received is to, should you encounter resistance, it is to be dealt with in the most decisive way possible. So Hmm. she looks at you, goes, why? What did you hear? Frankly, this was a re... The impression I got was this was a recon mission and not to be aggressive. The orders I have is be tip of the spear should you be needed. And she kind of looks at you. The new guy who's in charge of my orders. It's not lawyer. I'll tell you that. I'm actually rotated out from Stargate Command. I'm actually here on loan. And the orders I got were to, and she kind of motioned you towards the back of the, of of the vehicle towards the uh, gunnery station. And she kind of whispers in your ear, something ain't right, dude. I'm telling you, but she kind of, but she kind of pats you on your back to sort of, distract everybody else around them just to kind of give the impression you're having a friendly conversation. She's like, and man, I swear to God, you've gotten smaller. But she kind of shoots you the eyes saying, this ain't right, dude. I just give her the wink. So, uh, as you all sit down in your combat seating, um, Hall flips on the intercom and he takes over the targeting station. He's like, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will be your gunnery sergeant for this afternoon, blowing any and all shit that comes up across my targeting view screen. I've got bombs, I've got lasers, I've got machine guns, and something I don't, and something I'm not even quite sure what it does yet. So if you please want to make sure your trays are in their upright and locked position, we shall proceed to Mount Kickass where we shall eliminate bugs, ghouls, and anything else that I don't like and find spooky. It's going to be an adventure. So please, folks, don't forget to ask your person in the aisles for a Coke and a smile, and it is time to rock and roll. Selena comes over the intercom. Okay, Hall, cut the chatter. And she starts to drive the vehicle up towards Stargate. You hear Stargate Command come over the intercom asking, uh, is is everybody ready? And they start going uh, down the list. They go, Gunnery Sergeant Hall, ready? He's like, ready. Rodriguez, ready, go. Dr. Bob. Yes? 
<laughs> Dr. Bob has been staring at all the different instruments. <laughs> they go to uh, left, 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 ugh, Lieutenant Carter. Ready. Ready to roll. Commander Saul, is your team ready to proceed through the gate? Good to go. Selena turns back, looks at you guys, flips down the visor on her helmet, gives you all a thumbs up, and goes, if you've never been through a gate in a vehicle, it's a little bit rough. So uh, there are vomit bags beside you. I don't think any of you are going to need it. So the gate starts. They start doing the gate countdown sequence. Chevrons start locking. The gate wormhole whooshes to life. And uh, the vehicle starts to edge its way up the ramp towards the gate. And uh, just as she pulls up to the edge of the, of the wormhole, she goes, all right, guys. So from here on out, as far as I understand, we are on our own for a minimum 24 hours to observe and report. But beyond that, Commander Saul, you are in charge. Got it? Yep. All right, so she guns the engine. You jump through the gate. Because you're not traveling through on foot, it's a little bit like being rattled in a tin can. You feel a little bit sick at first. Uh, you notice the windshield outside immediately frosts over. But you also see kind of a pink energy start to spider web over the uh, front kind of windshield. Eventually, it snaps away as you emerge on the other side. And you find yourselves in the same dark cavern that was lit with bioluminescence uh, that the Mount probe discovered a couple of days ago. So Selena starts to run the engine into low, into, into a lower gear. And she starts to explore the uh, cavern. She's like, okay, te technical readings are starting to come in. Uh, we do have a breathable atmosphere. Um, oxygen's a little bit lighter than I would like folks. So, you might run out of breath if you happen to be running or exerting yourself. Please take note of this. Um, other than that, there are no de there are no contaminants detected in the air. Um, radiation levels are unusually high, but not dangerous to us, at least as far as I can tell. She looks over at uh, Gunnery Sergeant Hall, and he's like, "Okay, I'm just checking uh, targeting. There are active heat signatures." Uh, ma'am, but I'm not detecting anything in our immediate vicinity. Uh, Rodriguez turns around and she goes, all right, Saul, where do you want to go? She shows you a topographical map and uh, you can see there is the ridge where the map originally spotted um, Charmunda's forces and you can see what you theorize is an airfield, but bringing up the striker would probably reveal your position there are stone structures scattered in probably about a five kilometer area the best way to think about this would be a city that has a lot of stone buildings but the architecture is obviously broken down but there are very clear roads that have been built at by some civilization in the past and hmm. it's there, most of the buildings are fairly tall. There are lots of places to hide, and there aren't a lot of really open spaces outside of the airfield, which seems to be near some sort of a larger structure in the center of the city. So, all right. So we have the that vantage point. Yeah. Is there is there a location of like maybe? visual distance enough where they're not going to see the vehicle, but the vehicle can see us if we're on that ridge. Yes. There are positions which would be hidden probably by natural rock formations that you could probably hide the striker and you could easily hoof it up to the, um, to the, uh, to kind the of ridge. Vantage. Yeah. To the ridge. Yeah. That's what we're doing. We're going to, we're going to head up over here. He points to one of the rock formations can hide the striker here. We'll head up to the to that vantage point from the probe. See what we get. All right. So, all right. So, Hall or Hall and Rodriguez drive the striker with all you inside of it. You start 
proceeding takes you about 10 minutes to get to the location she marked on the map um because you are so far underwater and the only light is being provided by bioluminescence and the faint energy of the bubble dome that's keeping all the water pressure outside everything is bathed in kind of a kind of like the northern lights light so it's that kind of silvery greenish white color so it's probably a little a little more light than twilight but not enough to read by if you get where i'm going with this Mm. so you arrive at the ridge and uh you can get out of the vehicle and you kind of look around you can see you you act you can actually see the tracks where the mouth had 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 come through and uh nothing seems to like Nothing seems like it's been up here on this ridge in quite some time. You don't see any other tracks. And you can see uh, Chermunda's airfield and and the uh, building that they seem to be going in and uh, out of. Um, I, I presume all of you have uh, some kind of visual instrument to see farther. You've got binoculars or telescope okay so who who wants to take a look through their uh spotter scope first i might do it oh we can both do that i guess yeah we'll both do it may as well all roll right (laughs) yeah all right so all of you roll uh is that a perception or yes yeah that'll be a straight perception check five carter doesn't see shit (laughs) six (laughs) 16 Okay. All right. So Saul, so you're able to look through one of the uh, goggles that has enhanced mag ma- magnification and you're looking down and you're actually seeing some kind of another ship on the ground. It's not a death glider. It's some kind of other ship and it seems to be offloading what looks to be humans. Um, they're not Jaffa because they're not dressed in Tiger Guard armor, nor do they have the golden spot on their on their forehead. And, the, and you see them carrying pieces of equipment into this large uh, kind of structure. As you uh, look around further, you do see uh, on in the maps footage there were six Death Gliders. I think that's what I said. You see four on the deck right now. So two of them are presumably in the atmosphere or they could be uh, death gliders are space uh, atmospheric or they they can fly in space too, right? Yeah. They okay. don't have the light speed engines or anything, but okay. So they're, they're, they're basically like tie fighters. Okay. Yeah. So two of them are missing. They could be in space or they could be in Atmo. You're not sure. Um, other than that, you do see, like I said, a ton of Jaffa. Um, you see at least six of the tiger guards. Now, normally their armor is black. The ones you're seeing on the ground, four of them are wearing the black armor. Two of them are wearing kind of a bronzy chrome. So it sparkles a little bit more than what is probably uh, kind of noticeable. And are you they do fabulous, see, Mike? Yes. And you also see a person who seems to be... Uh, overseeing of them who looks like a fairly uh nondescript person of maybe southeast asian descent and it's a small man but he seems to be dressed in the same elaborate garb that charmunda would seems like charmunda's found an ally who the little guy sir Possibly. So while all this is kind of going on and you're looking at the deck, uh, you noticed some of the stuff that's coming out of the temple. Uh, you, you start to notice people are carrying stuff out and you're starting to see these large green rocks of some type. And, they're kind of like quartz. You're not sure what their purpose is, but they're starting to bring out them on these like skids and like kind of stuff like that. Basically they're being worked like slaves. So uh, I'm going to, is the equipment in like boxes and stuff that they're bringing in? No, they seem to be bringing 
like so, hand tools. What so might the be stuff's drills. very visible. Yeah. Um, I'm visible. just going to, I'm just going to roll uh, an engineering, just, just kind of piece to see if I can piece together what exactly they could be doing in the temple. Okay. Go for it. That is a 16. All right. So judging by what you're, what you've observed over the past 10 minutes, they're doing some kind of deep mining of some type. Those larger pieces of equipment they're carrying are likely some kind of a sonic or laser drill. It's not, it's definitely not Tari tech. It's probably some version of a Gual tech that may have been captured during an occupation, or maybe some of the other race that seems to be working with Charmunda's forces. The uh, other thing you notice is when you look at those people that are that are obviously being worked, you can definitely see they are human. Um, they don't display any outward markings. They don't. They're probably not people captured from Earth. But as we know, humans have been seeded throughout the galaxy as basically cattle for the Gould. So this is probably just a slave ship. That's something that you've definitely been able to establish. It's probably some kind of a transport. How it got down this far is interesting because you would presume using your engineering, the water pressure would probably crush that ship at this depth. And your knowledge of Gual transporters, as far as I understand, I don't think they can transport anything large ship-like because of the rings. So how this got through that is a mystery. Anyone else want to ro- roll again and see if they can't spot anything I missed? Yeah, yeah I'm trying to. Okay. I'm trying to think. Do I have anything that would? Uh, it's my person. Uh... Mike, could the argument be made that? Carter could use a sleight of hand to maybe notice stuff that other people wouldn't. Not applicable in this situation. You might okay. be able to notice if you were being pickpocketed or if you like, were watching somebody getting yeah. pickpocketed. Okay. I have, I have well, a I have a plus four for insight. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you can tell me how you wish to app- do an in, like what type of what type of insight are you looking for? I'm gonna try to see if I. So you said there's a bunch of people being worked as like slaves, right? Yes. I want to to use my insight to see if this the structure of this work camp is familiar to uh, the kinds of work camps that I would have seen before by other Gould uh, uh, system lords, like how they handled their okay uh, yeah all right see yep, if, it, totally if, if they're under the control of somebody that i might recognize or that me might be able to identify okay go for it all right so let's roll this <laughs> no whammies no whammies <laughs> let's go and that is with the plus four it makes it 19 looking at it it does have because of your experience with the gould and stargate sg1's multiple run-ins with Ra and Anubis and stuff like that, you recognize a particularly cruel streak in how these people are being handled because the Tiger Guards will actively bully the people that are bringing up the big green stones, but they're also remarkably careful as to not damage that. Basically they'll make sure whatever the slave is handling gets put down really carefully. And then they'll beat the snot out of them. You haven't seen anybody get killed, but you have seen a couple injured slaves get hauled off, presumably for some kind of really quick kind of medical treatment to get them back, to get them back working. So it's not, it's not just, I'm what I'm witnessing is not just cruelty for the sake of cruelty. It's a psychological thing they're doing on them, but they are damaging their bodies only to recover them because they don't want to lose production. Yeah, basically, from what you've observed, because you watch these people for about 10 or 15 minutes, they are working them around the clock. Like, you just get the, you get the sense that 
judging by how quickly they're trying to get people back up and moving again, they've pro this is something fairly new. Whatever they've discovered is probably something new, probably something valuable, and they're not wasting time because otherwise they would have brought more forces in through the gate and they're only using slave labor. So they're trying to keep forces directly under Charmunda's control, remarkably small and light, but they're making sure they have an adequate, ad, 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 uh, adequate workforce. So it's almost like she doesn't expect trouble. So I, I'm just, I'm just wondering the, the clear, uh, lackey or subordinate or whatever we're going to call him. Mm -hmm. Uh, does he have any reactions to uh any of the cruelty or stuff like that watching Just him like... watching him yeah. through the scope all three of you can now kind of zoom in and i'm going to roll something here so just give me a moment i have to unlock my phone all right okay so nothing happens um you see the person walk up to walk up to those big green stones as they're being gathered onto this huge uh into this huge pile and um every so often the person will walk over he'll bring out some kind of a hand device you can't tell exactly what it is you've never seen it before he'll he'll scan it he'll look over to the uh, tiger guards and he'll gesture with a up uh, kind of motion. The tiger guards will then uh, nod their their heads, their eyes will flash in their armor and then the work camp seems to get a little bit more driven moment by moment. So you've observed this behavior probably about half an hour, maybe 45 minutes uh, given the time that has passed. And as you guys are observing the ridge, you hear Gunnery Surgeon Hall come in over all of your headset radios. He goes, guys, I don't want to freak freak you out right now, but I've got a couple of bogeys coming in from the southeast. And they are coming in fast and hot. I'm going to turn off things and keep systems at minimal power. They might not notice us. Um, so... Might be in your best interest to find a place to hide. Yeah. All right. Uh, as, as you kind of look around, you do see a bunch of, like I said, there's a lot more rocks and boulders. There might be some um, shrubbery there. Nothing too dense or deep. Um, tons of dirt. Uh, what do you guys want to do? Is there any like giant trees that have fallen over and have like kind of a space or like how the hobbits hid in the first Lord of the Rings movie like that. Uh, no, but you do see a lot of what looks like ancient coral that has sort of petrified and mummified uh, over the centuries. Uh, you do see tons of that where you could in theory hide in it. Yeah, what is I thinking trees were underwater? Damn it. Uh, I guess Carter will try and hide underneath that. Okay, roll me uh, roll me your ability to hide. Stealth. Yes. Stealth, yeah. Uh, that's an eight. Okay, so you dive into the coral. Face it's, first. It uh, throws off like dust and dirt and kind of a a gross pungent smell as you uh, kind of do so. You're more covered in crusty bits than you are actually hidden. Okay, uh, so next. Saul is going to... Um, I, I'm assuming there's there's like some kind of like outcropping or something on this were, ridge. If you were to grasp the edge of the lid uh, of the ridge, there is a small outcropping underneath of it you could in theory get get into it you do risk falling however but you could I mean, in theory I, shimmy down that that's what i'm gonna do i right. 
I'm roll pretty it. dang strong, so. All right, roll it. And and I get uh, using my one of my racial traits, I get a plus four to any strength roll. Okay, go for it. That is a eighteen plus another four. That's a twenty-two. Okay, so you're able to shimmy down the side. You kind of hide in in this little cave. Um, the bioluminescence in here, it's fairly strong, but you, because it is so strong, you kind of blend in. So you are fairly, unless someone was looking directly at you and they knew where to look, they're not going to find you. Dr. Bob, what are you going to do? It's a little harder for me to hide. (laughs) Hey, I'm just as big as you. I was desperately looking through the book to see, can I dig into the ground and just bury myself? (laughs) But no, I I don't think I can because, yeah, because it's rock formations everywhere, right? So Yeah, he almost trip over Carl, Um, who's just kind of covered himself with basically leaves. (laughs) Well, coral bits and and dust. That's what I meant. I was trying to think. I so the room that we're in, like, is, is there a ceiling that's really like high up, or yeah, the, like you are outside overlooking this ridge. the The ceiling height to the energy dome is at least a couple of hundred feet minimum. Okay, so it's not like we're in a cave. No, you are outside oh, protected damn. by some kind of. An I was gonna barrier. crawl up like a fucking iguana and just like stay on the roof. <laughs> um, but since that's not a possibility. Uh, so what's what's around me again? We're on a, we're on a ridge. Yep, we've got the coral around. I don't have anything. Damn, this is like I wish I brought a blanket that I could lay under that like would camouflage me. Tell you what, I I will let you roll a d twenty at disadvantage. Okay, there is something in the Canadian military, and there are some, and there's also distributed to other militaries across the world it's essentially camouflage like ghillie suits but not oh, okay. quite it's like a poncho you can throw on real quick and it's a basic green and black camo pattern if you want to roll at disadvantage right. if you roll high you take the lowest number and if it beats i'm gonna say 15 you can pull one out of your kit okay let me let's just do this for fun let's see yeah let's see what happens okay 17 okay so that one does not count second one does five (laughs) unfortunately this was not in your particular kit this day as you're so big you don't think to pack gear like this i i go to pull it out of my pack but instead i'm like oh i packed i packed a picnic blanket and it's it's got like the red and and white (laughs) the red and white pattern stripes on it ah shit i packed the the lunch blanket (laughs) all right so as you are sitting there with the lunch blanket you see a death glider (laughs) scream overhead now does it notice you i'm rolling to spot dr bob with advantage we'll see what i get because you are on a ridge, they'd have to be looking for you. And I'm going to stand First roll was still. an eight. First roll is an eight. Second roll is a nat 20. They've oh, spotted you. So the death glider, you hear its engines start to power up and go. And then automatic fire starts lacing out of the ghouled laser cannons. Dr. Bob, um, roll me the dodge basically dexterity dexterity yeah all right one i need to see what a ghoul death glider does because this Uh, could suck let's see here so i got a plus one to dex uh 13 okay give me a sec here what is your armor class armor class is 12 okay just give me a sec i have to look this up vehicle death glider there we go how much damage do you do (laughs) and of course i can't find it when i need it so i'm going to say rather than it hitting you directly doc dr bob the explosive (laughs) power of the force from the shockwave knocks you flying 
They hit my blanket because that's a much easier target to hit. (laughs) Basically, your blanket kind of acted as enough of a distraction where they couldn't target you directly, but they hit right beside your feet. The blast throws you right to the edge of the ridge. Roll me a strength. So you have to catch yourself here. Uh, 16. Okay, so at the last possible second, you grab on, you use your Unas claws, and you dig right into the rock. It's scraping and screeching. A couple of your fingernails do rip off. Owie. But, <laughs> but just as you are getting right to the edge, your 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 remaining claws click. They hold into the rock nice and steady. And you're dangling probably about 200 feet above this city. The death glider keeps moving and it looks like it's going to take another pass. I'm going to immediately go on the radio. Gunnery Hall. You seeing what I'm seeing? He's like, hold on, sir. Targeting. And you just hear like this beep, 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 Fire! And you see this giant silver uh, blast of energy lance out from the striker. And you see the death glider just liquefy, not explode, liquefy in midair. Does it rain on us? Uh, Fortunately for you, the molten metal rains over a part of the city. You hear Hulk come over the radar. Ha! It works! That was fucking cool. We should move, guys. I'm just saying. We should. Good. Yeah, no, I want to lie here in the coral. Hey, <laughs> if that's your bag, dude, whatever. I'm not staying the stick around. Agreed. Okay, so you guys all haul ass back to the striker. Takes you just a couple of minutes. You, the door of the striker slides open. Um, Hall is sitting at crows. He's got some kind of a tactical heads up display, and he's just saying, "Okay, guys. So there are now five death gliders in the air. They haven't got to us yet." Uh, he looks back. He goes, "Captain, do you mind getting us the hell out of here? This isn't my stop." So she throws back the throttle, the engine rolls to life, and the eight-wheeled assault vehicle starts gunning it. He goes, Saul, where are we going? We can go into the city. We can try going back to go back through the gate, but we're supposed to remain and observe for 24 hours. But that plan just kind of got foobarred, sir. Go back to the cave. She goes, all right. So she starts gunning it, and... um After just a couple of minutes, it takes you probably about seven this time because she's running the engine real hot and real fast. She pulls into the uh, cave. Nobody seems to be in there. She shuts off the lights to the uh, truck. She orders Hall to point all the weapon systems that she can towards the opening of the cave mouth. And she turns off everything but the interior lights and the weapons. She goes, great. And now we wait. She kind of looks over at that to you kind of dryly in the dim red light of the interior. She goes, you know, nothing against you, Saul, but why is it every time we go out on mission, I get shot at? <laughs> Sometime, sometimes things just happen. And while they're having that, Carter tosses a roll of duct tape to Bob and makes the motion to bandage his uh, one claw that got wrecked. Dr. Bob, are you going to patch yourself up? (laughs) Dr. Bob is just staring at his hands going like, ow! (laughs) (laughs) Ow! Why why wasn't I wearing gloves? (laughs) All right, so you start to kind of patch yourself up, and you you did take two points of damage, Doc, Doc, Dr. Bob. You will heal this quickly, though, as it is a regeneration thing, so don't, don't even worry about marking it down. Okay, so it's going to be fairly quick. It's, so yeah. it's ba- basically, I broke a nail, and it hurts a bit, so I put a Band-Aid on it. Yeah, more or less. So all this happens, and because death gliders have that high pitched squeal of an engine, you hear them just buzzing and surrounding. You can see, you can hear some fire going on outside. 
it is getting persistently closer as time moves on but you don't see any Jaffa troops approaching the cave Hall is just glued to the radar station for like crows and he looks over at Selena and he's like Captain I do not like the look of this we've got maybe three shots left in that shard cannon I don't know whether the rest of our guns are going to be able to touch those things and I don't want to miss and hit whatever that is you call a ceiling. See, uh, I was going to say, uh, Dr. Bob just turns and says, why? Why don't we just shoot the ceiling and then go through the gate and leave? Selena Carter perks up when he hears that. He looks <laughs> like at a, the and, 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 and I mean, uh, Dr. Bob, like, I know I've, I've, I've taken the oath to do no harm, but this might be better than what these people have had to deal with in the first place. And whatever's happening here can't be good. Selena kind of turns around in her chair. She looks back at Saul and goes, well, Saul, it's your call commander. Something is happening here. We should at least find out what before we crush these people. Agreed. The prop the problem is we're currently compromised, or at least somewhat compromised. They're going to be on high alert at le- for a little bit. Hall kind of pipes up. Gunnery Sergeant Hall goes, Well, sir, as far as they know, one of their death gliders was taken out. They know that for sure. They don't know how. They could chalk it up to mechanical malfunction, but I'm doubting it. Oh, okay, correction yeah, and, and alteration of my idea. Can we rig something up to make it look like it was taken out by, I don't know, like a ground-to-air missile or a rocket launcher? Can we leave, like, a fake camp so that they'll think that we took it out with some weapon that's on the ground? They don't realize we have this vehicle? Uh, Hall goes, oh, I don't know, you could leave behind one of the sentinel beams. I suppose. I mean, it's a laser gun, right? Leave that. Pew, pew. Leave that there. Leave that with my blanket on the ground. Like, make it look like somebody was camped out there. Hall goes well, Captain. It's not a terrible idea. I mean, they. Like it, it'll I mean, distract they, them for, for a little bit at least. Yeah, I mean, they already know we're here, but they don't know we've got you know bug stomper. So, well, it's not a completely stupid idea. He uh, ah, looks at. I'm not completely stupid. Ha <laughs> um, ha. Right, any of uh, us have any of us have good stealth? Because <laughs> I sure as hell don't. I got a plus two. You're uh, better than. I, I have than a both minus us, one. Rob. Now I have a yeah. plus six to survival. So if we have to get like Rambo first blood in here, I'll be okay. <laughs> but uh, and what do, do yeah. I have anything? Else Carter starts this? breaking out that uh, I forget what you call it, but like that camo paint that you see Arnold <laughs> painting on himself in Commando, and he just starts getting ready. It goes, he yeah, like... yeah. Um, Hall goes Carter. well. Hall, she go. Uh, he says, "Man, it's really weird having the last name." He goes, "Lieutenant, it's probably not the worst idea in the world. You are the fastest of all of us." And he he, uh, he kind of looks at uh, Selena and goes, and she can't exactly run right now. She's essentially just a bus driver. So it's up to you, soldier. But I don't outrank you. So it's up to you or your commander. It's not a bad idea. They might think a sentinel bean did it. And I can always rig the sentinel bean that when they pick it up and leave him a little party popper and he holds up a grenade. Because it's not like we want to give them technology, sir. Yeah. Just now, because... Let me see. What's my science on here? Uh, You could put a claymore underneath the sentinel beam, so when they pick it up, the this end towards enemy blows up when they pick it up. Now, I'm not an engineer. I don't have an engineering thing, but I do have a plus uh, two to science. I could take that weapon, the the sentinel beam, and rig it so that it's going to it goes beyond its means and overloads itself if they try to use it or investigate it. Yep, you could definitely so, uh, do that. Take so they, so because th- that way they could look at it and go, 
And if they see, oh, the readings are pretty high, they must have uh, altered it so that it could blast way stronger. And they go to test it, and it just blows up in their hands. Yep, that's a pretty Carter good idea. nods at this, but you see a visible look of dissatisfaction as he puts the claymore back in the bag. <laughs> Clay- I- Bob looks turns says, like they can see a claymore, they can't see it's that that's that been programmed to overload. <laughs> That doesn't make Carter feel any better. If you want, you can put the. Why don't you put the claymore against the you know one of the coral things behind them so they get hit from two sides? That's a good idea. And he 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 kind of perks up at that. See, we both get to have fun with our toys. <laughs> Making right. more things go boom before nine a.m. So is that the plan you guys are going to do with? Yeah. All right. Yep. So Hall, you grab one of the Sentinel beams. You hand it to Doctor Bob. You have a. You have a small uh, tool kit, which can take apart most of the Sentinel beams because they are partially alien tech, but a lot of the internal components have to be serviced by humans. So there are mixed technology parts in here, but you recognize most of it. So I basically go beep, boop, 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 and take a little green wire and attach it to a red wire. And uh, then uh, anybody have a paper clip? Yeah. And I w- no, wait a second. I pull out a paper clip. And then I MacGyver uh, a, a bridge over one of the things so that the capacitor is no longer oh, being please, used. Please, Alex, if anything, we're MacGruber. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, it's, I don't think it, but Dr. Bob's looking, he's like, how is he going to, okay, this capacitor is the pro-. And I just start ripping out, I start ripping out resistors all throughout it. So it's like, so, how, how much well, more powerful is it? Mm, it's just, it's, <laughs> there's nothing it's resisting. There's nothing holding back its charge. It's like, right. it, instead of taking like three seconds to go whoop, and then fire a beam, it's just going to have all the power all at once. It'll be like sticking a fork in a, in a socket. All right. So roll me your, I guess it's intelligence plus science, Ken. That would be the roll. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. So one second here. That is 15. All right. So after about five minutes, you're able uh, to mess with it. You're able, you are relatively sure right now that it should work. It should overload. Um, You've never fired a Sentinel beam before, but your theory is remarkably sound. So in theory, it should work. My basic science is there's less resistors, meaning more boomy exactly so all right so you hand the modified sentinel beam to carter uh as a game note you can fire this weapon if you needed to once and it might not kill you but if a gual tries to fire it they may try and fire it multiple times you will get one shot off safely so so don't spam fire so basically we know that we'll have to press the trigger very lightly and for like half a second yeah basically you have the ultimate glass cannon delete button okay uh now quick question mike do the zats uh work the same as like just a normal pistol more or less for terms of combat zats work once is a stun at a significant damage i'd have to look up the damage first one hurts first one knocks out third one kills yes so it's one two three but but in terms of game mechanics just because i figure instead of taking something that's gonna go bang it might be make more sense to take a zat because if the tiger guards hear it they might think it's another system lord did you bring zat guns I'm assuming with the arsenal, there had to have been a couple of zats. We got staff weapons. Uh, and there are no zats among them. You have Damn it. you have two staff, four uh, ADS rifles, and four uh, sentinel beams. Now you have three. Okay. Plus uh, a couple of P90s and a couple of shotguns and one machine gun. And Carter does has his G36, but I think P90 sidearm and a knife are probably the most he'll take with him out besides the sentinel just yeah. in case he has to defend himself yeah so yeah and uh i think because we were going on self we would have already had like the black or darker uh suits going like combat uniform so yeah carter starts making his way as quick as he can to the where the remains of bob's blanket are okay so i need you to roll me what the equivalent would be of endurance i Mm -hmm. guess that's a strength roll right ken yep 
Okay, so roll me a strength roll, and you are rolling with disadvantage because of the thinner atmosphere. It's like roll and then add my dex or yeah. strength to both, right? No. Uh, so you're going to roll strength, right? Yeah. And then you add your strength bonuses, yes. And you take the lowest number. Uh, amazingly, I got double 14s. Okay, so you are 17 able... 17 total. Okay, so you both got, so since both rolls are 17, you pass. So you're able to run as quietly as you can and as quickly as you can to the location of where you were shot at. You can openly see there are five death gliders in the air and they are scanning the area. Occasionally, they'll pop off shots. They aren't anywhere near you right now. So you set up your little trap. You find the remains of Dr. Bob's picnic blanket. You put down the Sentinel gun and you partially bury a claymore and you attach the trip wire to the gun. So when they try, they can pick it up just fine. But if they try to pull it, Boom. They try to fire it for anything longer than half a second. Boom. boom. So they are getting, so they are in theory getting headed, hit from two angles. So you, I want you to roll me strength again so you can make it back on. Actually, you're going to roll me first. You're going to roll, you're going to roll me stealth rolling at disadvantage because it is fairly open terrain. What did you get? Uh, That's an 11 total. Okay. So. I'm going to roll for the death gliders. Um, and, and boom, no more Carter. <laughs> and boom, no more Carter. Okay, so the death gliders, the first one does not see you. Second one <coughs> sees you. Third one does not see you. Hold on a second. <coughs> Fourth one sees you. Fifth oh, one shit. does not see you. So two death gliders kind of pull an almost impossibly hair, hair, hairpin turn in midair and you immediately start coming at you fast and hard. Uh, so if you want to, what is your, uh, that's, what is your dexterity that's Carter? the name of your porno fast and hard? <laughs> <I'm> sorry. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't like, hold that. <laughs> Sorry, is that what my my bonuses are just uh, the base stat? What is your armor class? Oh, my armor class is 10. Dexterity is 14. Do you have any armor? Uh, maybe a flak vest with the uniform, but that's about it. Uh, what does that, what does that, uh, what does that add to you? Oh, uh, I don't. Let me check my... Honestly, I think I neglected to put that in my equipment notes. Okay, but so... If, you, if you wanted to go with base, just for the sake of ease, yeah. I have a, a, a leather, you know, vest that I wear that's like a my version of a, of a Kevlar vest. And it was... Yeah. A, uh, the armor defense was 11 plus a dex value. Yeah. So... so so if it's something similar, like, and I picked mine based on that there wasn't one for my species size, and it was based on the human one. Yeah. So, all right, Carter. So you're gonna roll your, uh, basically armor. Cl- that, well, I'm gonna see if they can hit you. They've spotted right. you, but can they hit you? So the first death glider is gonna take a dual shot from its cannon. So it's it's gonna fire twice. And it's first attack roll. What is the number that I'm supposed to hit? You said 11? Yeah, it's 11 plus plus dex is for like a vest. Yeah, so 11 plus dex. So what's your dexterity then? uh, 11, so it'd be 13 13. because my dex is plus 2. Okay, so the first attack hits. Second attack hits. Let's deal damage. Because I don't have their stats right in front of me, I'm going to say... They're at such a far enough distance that things will be a little bit different. So um, 3d6 damage. So one, two, three, seven points of damage from the first from the first death glider blast. Oh, fuck. Second one, 
one, two, three for 14 points of damage. Oh, shit. Are you alive still? I have three points left. Okay. I'm going to allow something to happen here. And we're going to see what happens when I'm going to say the other Death Glider is going to, it spotted you, but because of the stuff that's being thrown up by it hitting you for like all the debris and dust, can it target you accurately? So the second Death Glider is rolling with disadvantage for both of its shots. This is like your platoon moment where your arms are throwing up in the air. <laughs> yeah. First, first shot from the Death Glider is an 11. It misses. Or it will miss, probably. Second shot is a 17. Definite miss. Second Death Glider shot. First roll is a 14. Second roll is a, tw- is a 10. What did I need to hit again? Uh, 13. Uh, yeah, 13. Okay, so the second one is a hit, dealing one, two, three, nine points of damage. I'm down. Okay, so you, uh, what is your max total hit points? 17. Okay, so the second Death Glider, once he sees you go down, the other shots do not, they go wide as you hit the ground. Because Carter, all through the yeah, year. you are basically throwing, you are hit. Uh, the last couple shots did shred your vest and enough of the energy hit you. You're thrown clear. You are, you are ragdolled and I will allow you to speak for 10 seconds beginning now to get one last radio communication out. Time starts now. I'm hit device planted. I love hockey. (laughs) All right. So what is going to happen to Lieutenant Carter Hall as he set a trap for the Gwald, but they know you're here. And first contact protocol of observe and report has definitely been broken. So what's going to happen to Stargate Twig? They definitely have a big gun, but uh, will the team's heart and soul be taken down by a Gwald death glider? Well, we're going to stay tuned to find out as I'm sure I messed up some of these rules but that's okay. It's dramatic and we're all having fun here. So for Stargate Twig, as we begin to finish out season one, we have been from the great city of Kitchener. Uh, Alex playing Dr. Bob. From the wonderful water planet and all sorts of strange places known as New Jersey. Ken playing Saul. And bounced around like the proverbial hockey puck. Uh, JT from Saskatoon playing Carter Hall, who's about to see his ancestors. (laughs) All right, guys, I have been your gate master for this evening, Mike the Birdman. So thank you for joining us. We will be concluding Stargate SG Twig in the next three episodes. So stay tuned for the thrilling conclusion of season one of Stargate Tactical Weapons Integration Group. And until next time, folks, Chevron's Lot. (laughs) 